Hello and welcome to episode number 203 of the ET PhD team podcast with myself and you, just you, Anna. Just you. <laughs> just, just you. <laughs> you're looking very cosy today. It is bloody freezing. That's why I like yeah. it's it's felt like all the seasons all at once in the last week. It's crazy. It's truly, truly wild. And then I woke up this morning and I was like, why is there frost on the ground? The, the, I thought we were warm now. I thought we were past this. But I went out for a walk last night and I, there was like the most beautiful sunset. Beautiful. And then two minutes later, I was getting hammered by like golf ball sized <laughs> hailstones. I was like, what the what the bloody hell? <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I can't comp uh can't uh What's the word? Can't plan. Don't know what to wear. Don't know what to do. Don't know what to oh, take with you. No. And I'm going to London this weekend and I'm like, oh, I really would like to wear this new dress that I bought. And I've just thought, why? I can't even think. I'm even thinking, can I even wear white trainers? Is it going to be muddy and wet and dark? British weather. I mean, we love... I mean, I'd say white trainers in London anyway. <laughs> well, I don't know what... <laughs> oh, I really can't cope. I've also been looking on um so I'm having to replace my Balenciaga trainers, aren't I? Because Balenciaga is an ogo. <laughs> and I'm gonna put them to the back of the cupboard in the hope that in 10 years time they're like retro and it's okay and like it's acceptable to wear them again. But it's a really sad time because I put off buying those shoes for two years because my, <laughs> friends, my friends were like, they're ugly, they're ugly, like you can't get them. And I was like, no, but I really like them. And they said, you'll go off them. Two years later, I thought, I really, really want them still. So then I treated myself to them. And then six months later, no, nope, <laughs> no Balenciaga for you. Livid. You should have just bought them a time. There's a life lesson there. If you really want something and you mm. trust that you like it, don't listen to your friends. Don't listen to the naysayers and the haters. Just just do it so um yeah I've, I've been trolling tiktok um to find out what's in style <laughs> <laughs> yeah see i'm too lazy for that i still just like get my stitch fix box and if i like it then i'll buy it but if i don't it just goes back <laughs> yeah i know you did inspire me a little bit to try that i i it's more shoes for me i'm not mm. sure on the right the type right type of footwear and i always feel like i'm a season behind of footwear i always feel like well, clearly it takes me two years to buy a pair of trainers. So I thought, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna look. And then I saved one TikTok that was like, oh, these trainers are the in trainers. And then now my TikTok is just filled with shoes. So it's a good time. It's crazy how it just picks up on that. I just uh I shared the other day there's this meme. I don't even know what it's like from with uh Nicolas Cage and Pedro Pascal. And it was like when your coach when you say to your coach, I don't like walking lunges and they program you Bulgarian splits and it's just the face that made me laugh and now that's all I see when I scroll like in various forms I'm, like, I'm still here for it it still makes me laugh <laughs> oh I, I mean I appreciate the algorithm when it's memes it took me a long time to get memes onto my Instagram page because uh, it just it was so many just thin white people doing yoga or in the gym and then or women or like half naked women that's all it was and I was like is that I'm not liking these this stuff. It's just based on, I guess, like the stuff that I talk about. So I'm very pleased that I even have memes on my Instagram. <laughs> right, have you this. seen, just saying, because I know we have people that will appreciate this, that Lindsay Lohan is pregnant. <gasps> yeah, so yesterday, obviously when it was announced, and then I saw a meme that was like, we know Lindsay Lohan's not just going to be a regular mom. <laughs> oh, she's going to be a girl. <laughs> oh that's such oh that's great news good for her bloody love Lindsay Lohan she's oh yeah I love her so oh good. that's great news thanks for bringing that into my day I feel you're more than welcome <laughs> genuinely touched by I'm that like, who's going to appreciate this as much as I am oh, I think you are <laughs> yes I I 100% do oh what great news to start the day Congratulations to Lindsay Lohan. <laughs> She's listening. Um, okay, let's get cracking with the questions. Do you want to go first? Um, yes. So this is new client. How do you stop mid-binge when you're well in the depths of it? You may be able to recognise it, but you still can't stop yourself. Great question. I think this is actually... I think this is actually one of the hardest parts of any of this journey, and it's a question that we get a lot. Um my answer to this has probably changed quite a bit in the recent years, but realistically, I think at that point, it's less about thinking cognitively and more about thinking like in your feeling in your body. Often when we're kind of 
mid binge we're very dysregulated we're very um hyper arousing and in that state our brains don't think uh optimally like we can't we can't make conscious decisions in line with our future self like it's it's very very difficult to do that so what we want to do in those moments actually is work from like the bottom up approach rather than the top down approach and so in those moments doing something that is going to regulate your nervous system is ideal and so I mean to get to that point of being able to stop mid binge requires a lot of work outside of that in terms of mindfulness and awareness and things but if you can even notice what you're doing even though and this is this might feel weird for people that have never binged before they might not understand this but obviously you'll know from speaking to people and 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 things that like you can notice mid binge that you're doing it logically know that you want to stop but don't want to stop and you don't want to stop in that moment so it takes a lot of um it's not about willpower but it takes a lot of intention to say right I'm just going to do this grounding work now and then I'll decide what I want to do after that it can be quite a hard thing to do but in that moment I would recommend things like box breathing or prolonged exhale breathing I really like compassionate breathing where you um put your hand on your heart we speak about this all the time and breathe in for four seconds breathe out for six seconds or eight seconds or taking your shoes off and doing like a little bit of walking around the around the floor and noticing your feet on the floor um I know you've got some somatic stuff that you like to do like butterfly taps and um, can be really helpful or running your hands under cold water one of Becca's clients likes to do that just to help bring her back to the present moment anything that supports you in coming back to that like present moment and grounding your body so that again it does require a thought a cognitive thought of like I'm going to make this decision to do these bottom up things but before you do anything else you want to soothe your nervous system and come back to like that baseline Mm. I've been I was talking to Steph about it I've been like exploring I'm probably gonna say this wrong like binaural beats binaural I think yeah 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 Yeah. and (laughs) because it was from listening to Rosie's one of Rosie's yoga playlists there was one that I was just like oh my god this is this is dreamy it really helped like bring me back down even if I didn't notice that I was feeling out of sorts or something and it reminded me I know we've spoke about this before when I've done EMDR and like there's a metronome as well and I was like there's something something about it so I've explored it a little bit more and I've actually got like a little playlist that I've been having on any time that I am feeling a bit dysregulated a bit anxious a bit like I said out of sorts and I'm wondering whether something like that as well that you can just it's on your phone and you can go because the awareness is there you recognize that it's happening and you want it to stop so if we can make it really simple and just play something that might help you to and like breathe through it Mm. something like that um but I'm a big big fan of those yeah like and I think I think like you have to when people start like like you said the pause is the hardest thing to implement and I think people often forget that being able to pause midway when you recognize what's going on is a huge win absolutely huge like there'll be times where clients will be like do you know what I didn't finish the packet of biscuits and that is such a big step forward and like more evidence that you can build in saying well actually I think I might be able to kind of get a hold of this and be able to to stop this from happening in future yeah I totally agree I think um also if you have like a hey google or a hey alexa thing you can be like hey google play Byron all beats you don't even need to pick up your phone and then it's there straight away um interestingly I was speaking to Steph about this recently yesterday about um so we're doing a lot of ADHD stuff at the moment and one of the things she was talking about was mindful movement with her clients and how um often basic meditation and things can be quite difficult for people with ADHD and one of the the ways that you can incorporate in is to incorporate mindfulness around your movement patterns and I yesterday did a Spotify um 
track which I shared on my stories and I I, I can't remember exactly what it's called but it was like metronome beats or something like that um I'll find it in a minute and that was a metronome where you it's like 20 minute track so you run to the metronome so it doesn't matter how like far like how um long your pace is you know what's your pace what's what's it called your stance no what's it called eight yeah, let's go with that. Um, it doesn't <laughs> matter how long it is, so you don't have to be running really fast. It doesn't like I was just doing like many steps to to the metronome, and the idea is that you step to the metronome and then you align your breathing to that too. So, so I think last week I was speaking about how I've been doing a lot of um, breath work whilst I've been on a walk of like breathing in for four steps and breathing out for six steps or something like that. And I've been try- playing around with different ways of doing it, box breathing and stuff as a walk to see what feels nice, different pace, etc. And And um, this was a-, a track that kind of got you to do it without actually having to think about it. And it was really immersive, really, really good in terms of the mindfulness or the, the-, the mindful state that it created was great. I want to try some different tracks because... I didn't really love how much this person was talking throughout. <laughs> Do you know, like when you meditate, everyone's different, right? And everyone likes a different level of guidance, but I don't like, I like to be given the space to to be when I'm meditating. And sometimes when people just keep talking over it, it's like, just shh. And then, so I want to try and find some more, but I'm going to actually find it because I feel like some people might actually quite like to try it. And if you have ADHD, especially it might be something you want to do. It's called... A guided run flow 20 minutes and it's on wisdom and beats podcast so if you like that um and the, the only other thing i would say in terms of like stopping mid bench is if you struggle to even get to that point a basic daily mindfulness practice or meditation practice and getting more comfortable with slowing down and being intentional with your actions so that you are um responding not reacting that is one of the things that will allow you to create that space as Victor Frankl says that space between stimulus and response what is it between stimulus and response there is a space and in that space lies our power to choose and there's something at the end of it that I always forget but anyway um practicing mindfulness and, and daily kind of meditation and stuff can be really really helpful to, to even allow you to create that space in the first place okay <clears throat> George's question is it normal? In the past, I used to plan a lot, like I had a list of things to do and I would be ticking off. Now I keep many days broadly empty with one or two critical tasks and I gave myself permission to complete or not the rest. Most of the days I do even more than I used to plan and I feel much more refreshed. Why is that? Oh, that's, I'm so here for that, right? Because I think we end up like, or maybe this is me me speaking for myself here, is that I have definitely fallen into cramming, trying to cram so much into my day that I end up feeling completely overwhelmed and procrastinating, not giving everything my full attention and trying to like multitask and do a million and one things at once because I have so much of these things to do. Whereas actually like this client has done, prioritizing what needs to be done and then anything else is a is a added extra I think that means you're giving everything like you're able to approach the task with full intention probably more productive in the process because you're not thinking about everything else that you've got to do um and then it becomes more of a well I have the time so I might like I want to do these things um and I guess like it's a big step out of the like all or nothing perfectionist type thinking isn't it yeah yeah I agree I think um I think you're moving from a place of I have to do these things to I'm choosing to do these things and that alone is going to make you not make you feel more refreshed but it's going to leave you feeling more empowered and and we know that when you frame things as want to rather than have to we tend to see better outcomes with that so when you've got a huge list of stuff you're running through the day and you're constantly telling yourself I have to get this done I have to get that done whereas if you've got this like a list of a few things that you are have to get done and then it's like oh now I've got this space I'm going to choose to do 
like I'm going to study because I've still got I still want to do this part of my studying or I'm going to choose to do I don't know go to the supermarket whatever it is your framing of that is just infinitely lighter um and I think we should always try and frame things as want to rather than have to right like we didn't have to do this podcast today we chose to do this podcast and what a luxury that is that that's part of our work and that framing alone is just really powerful um so this is advice on a workout split when you're not trying to build muscle right is there an optimal one um not really it's not i would a couple of things is is this person a previous competitor uh swimmer ex-swimmer Okay, right. I was going to say because there are there there's there are only really certain situations where I would question like why don't you want to what's stopping you from wanting to build muscle, um not because I think building muscle is aesthetically better than it than not but more because we know that muscle mass is correlated with longevity and health so it's a really good thing to have so that was the first thing I wanted to double check because obviously if you're maybe a competitor before or an athlete before then you may already have um. I say sufficient muscle mass but like um a level of muscle mass that is sufficient for where you're at right um realistically it's not about the workout split it's just about managing your overall volume so I would just be mindful of your volume I would probably stick with like three sessions a week um keeping a reps in reserve of three or four rp of six ish um and just kind of doing like Normally for hypertrophy, we're looking at 10 to 20 sets per muscle group per week um, and then progressing on that. So just staying on the lower end of that, of like, you could even probably do eight to 10 um, sets per week per muscle group and, and keeping it there. And although it's about managing volume, you're still going to have to eventually, probably if you're training well, increase the weight that you're lifting to some degree. Because what will happen is say that you're, say you were squatting 50 kilograms in January and that was four reps in reserve by June squatting 50 kilograms is going to be like potentially eight reps in reserve or something like that so in order to maintain maintain things you are going to have to increase the weight that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be increasing muscle mass um and then I would also potentially like you might want to work more on strength so keeping your reps slightly lower but um that would be it I don't know if you'd add anything to that no not not really I think I think removing the idea that there is like a vest here and just have like making sure that regardless of what you're doing you're having a bit of fun in the process um because I guess like you say you want to be no <laughs> You want to be making sure that you're making some progress, I think, or, or knowing that, like like you said, naturally your body's going to get used to the load. So ensuring in that sense, but you're not kind of, if you're not working towards building muscle, then just go in there and have a bit of fun. I think you're not going to have to be as monotonous. Like, dare I say, you could go in and mix things up <laughs> each week. <laughs> <laughs> wild wild do you know what? i'm going into the gym today i'm quite excited i'm just going to go in today and just do versions of hip thrusts just because i was i was thinking to myself i've been doing a lot of hip thrusts lately and i'm and i want to try and add some variety but i've not done any barbell stuff so i'm just going to go in and I'm like i might do some hip thrusts i might just do a leg day oh just, just why not right skip out those two upper body movements and just stick to leg. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. why why the heck not i'm very excited um okay becca's question um why is it that i know what i need to be doing but i almost don't want to before i reach for something like chocolate or any carbs to overeat i think in my head that this, that this isn't what i want to be doing but then i still do it over and over why am i doing this and how do i overcome it what a question Mm. I I think two two things here is that potentially well I say potentially it likely is habit and like any other habit 
it's going to take a bit of work for it not to be your your go to the thing that you turn to um, all of the time. But equally, and I know we've spoken about this before, that coping mechanism has been like it served a purpose for you and recognizing that. And I think having that acceptance and that compassion in that, okay, this this is what I have done for however long and it's met that need. But now I'm trying to build my toolbox and understand what it is I truly need in that moment. And it's just going to take a bit of time to to work through. But the fact that you can recognize that I don't want to do this, going back to kind of that pause and being able to check in, okay, well, what is it that I need and what can I replace the food with? Like that's going to be the the next step. And it's not going to be easy because like I said, it's part habit and and it's just going to take a bit of time to work through. Yeah, I completely agree. I think there's a couple of things kind of coming back to this first question is in that moment of overeating, we're not often thinking um, straight, so to speak. It's not often a cognitive decision. And the way that I describe sometimes breaking these habits is, um, which I may have said on the podcast before, think about this, think about a field of hay, right? And then think about at the start of the field of hay is where you are and you get this trigger to overeat and over or over time what you've done is whenever you've had the trigger to overeat well no sorry (laughs) that's the worst explanation ever (laughs) let me start again right you've got this field of hay in the past whenever you've had a trigger so for example um let's say boredom right what you've done is you've overeaten because at some point in your life when you were a kid and you were like, mom, I'm bored, she gave you food. I'm sure that's not the situation and this is not me blaming a mom, but this is just an example, disclaimer. So what's happened in your head is every time you were bored, you overate, bored, overate, bored, overate. And when you were doing that, what you were doing is if we're in this field of hay, you're like trodding down the hay in this one pathway. So eventually you've got like this very clear pathway in the hay of like, okay, when I'm bored, I overeat and I just frolic down that part of the hay field right what you're trying to do now is you're trying to build a new pathway through the hay so when you're bored it's very very easy to fall down that open pathway and what you're doing with becca is creating new tools and new strategies to deal with that boredom that take you down this new pathway of hay however hay is very robust it takes a little bit of time to trodden it down all the way to the end and so sometimes even though you're like I don't really want to be doing this I know what I'm doing this is the path of least resistance that big open pathway that you've already trodden down a million times before so when you're tired you know when you're in a rush when you just want something quickly to just ease that feeling you're rolling down that field of hay frolicking some may say and so that's like that's in a nutshell why it feels like you're doing it even though you kind of don't want to do it because logically you know you don't necessarily want to do it but but sometimes our dysregulation can feel the most soothing thing so if food has always been a thing that you've self-soothed with or tried to self-soothe with it does leave you feeling like it does help to regulate you in the short term and so logically we're like well this is this is not the right thing for me to do right now or this is not the one thing I want to do but in our bodies it's like oh well that does that does feel kind of soothing so that's why I'm going to do it so like you said it just takes that time to implement different strategies and to um create that new pathway in the field of hate to frolic down and um try and show yourself a bit of compassion of like why am I doing this like and I mean I say why am I like this all of the time um because why i like this but um show yourself a bit of compassion like this is a journey that you're on and what's amazing is that you're already noticing the voices in your head like they're already having that conversation like you were saying earlier anna to to even notice that you want to have that to have that pause and to notice the conversation in your head is like amazing and the other thing is like you don't have to honor all of your wants and that sounds potentially controversial but like just because in the moment you like you think oh I want to have this or I don't want to have this like you don't have to listen to those voices in your head 
get curious about them get curious about the conversations that you're having and then think about okay well what's my values what's most important to me right now and then make a decision based on that not the voices that are chattering on in your head chattering it's that word Ch- chattering I was gonna say I, was like, I, don't, I don't, don't think so <laughs> chattering although I do feel like chattering is a nice word and I feel like maybe I'll bring that into my life but no, <laughs> Um, okay go for it how to eat mindfully in social situations when you want to be part of the conversation that's a false dichotomy in that mindful eating is being aware and non-judgmental in the moment right that's all it really is you can be aware whilst also being social and being in the moment and non-judgmental um I I like to just think when I'm with other people, I will when I have conversations, I like to and I encourage my clients to do this, just put your put your cutlery down and have a conversation. And then when you finished that part of the conversation, eat. Like it's not it, being mindful of your food is also being mindful of your experience. Mindful is just being aware of everything that's going on. So you can sit there and you can say, Oh, I've got this pizza in front of me and I've got all of this commotion and loud noise around me and I've got alcohol around and all of these things. Okay, that's fine. That's just the that's just your experience. It's not, okay, well, now I can't be mindful because there's loads of noise. It's like, I remember doing being in a meditation class once in California and um, there was like 12 steps, I think, or eight next door. And so they were all sharing stuff and they were quite like, at that point, I don't know what they were doing, but they were like quite loud. And my meditation teacher was kind of laughing and he was like, this is part, like this is part of mindfulness meditation of noticing these things and not getting lost in them. Now to not get lost in the stories that people are telling you next door in like a sharing group is is quite challenging. Um, So it's just about noticing them and saying, okay, I noticed that noise. I'm not going to name it. I'm not going to get lost in it. I'm just going to say, oh, there's a noise there and I'm going to come back to what I'm doing. And it's the same when you're mindfully. And it's like, just take your time and just notice things are going on without judgment and just even if you're the last person to finish your meal like it's not no big deal Mm. it like that made me think I think I've shared it in the the group the episode from Michael Singer's podcast like the first one and it's like surrendering the mind and rather than like thinking that you need to clear the mind it's just noticing what's going on but choosing not to not to engage and obviously like when you're out eating with someone yes you are engaging in that conversation but that that's what you're present on is that and then when you do eat you can tune in and be mindful of what what's going on there it's not to say it's all like one thing or the other um and I guess like I think it's so many people see like when going out for a meal as a as a bit of a when I say issue because they've been so mindful at home whereas if we think well actually no now I'm getting into a really good routine when I'm at home and I can check in and notice how I'm feeling and I'm paying attention to the food fantastic now's your next challenge to kind of further flex (laughs) those mindful (laughs) skills (laughs) yeah yeah totally agree Okay, next question. What's your favourite vegetarian protein that isn't too high carb? I mean, vegetarian protein tends to be, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, Greek yoghurt. Well, yeah, but I was going to say there's only so much yoghurt. I can now I can can eat a lot of (laughs) yoghurt. But agreed, agreed. Oh, got some 2% the other day. We treat, I don't feel like 2% is actually that accessible. It's often either 5% or 0%. 2%. It's just like the sweet spot. Um, What's mine? I quite like, I mean, realistically, I think the point of this is that vegetarian and vegan proteins, like you said, they tend to be higher in carbohydrates or fat as well as protein. And if you're moving from being a meat eater to a vegetarian, um, you will often struggle initially because you're like, well, I need to have a protein source, a carbohydrate source and a fat source in this meal. And actually, that's not really going to be a helpful way of eating when you're eating vegetarian, vegan sources. It's more like, OK, this is my protein source. How am I going to add add to this to make a complete meal? But it might be that you 
don't have as many carbs and fats or you might like you might have more fiber and like more of a plant-based um like vegetable based meal with and then the protein just adds in the carbs so that you have slightly less rice with that or pasta with that etc um and I think if you're mindful about it you do you still get the same satiety from it but you just have to relax on trying to just get protein from a protein source because it's very difficult with vegetarian stuff I mean I I had them last night do you know what I had last night I was craving which I don't crave very often but I was craving egg fried rice so I got a bag one of the microwave bags of egg fried rice and I got the three Linda McCartney sausages and um tender stem broccoli and like fried it in like loads yeah. of salt and just had this mountain of just oh it was so com- it was so comforting and warm it was, and just salty and delicious I think maybe I was dehydrated if I was craving egg fried rice <laughs> just salty and salty broccoli that was great I love I love Linda McCartney sausage I love um I don't I don't think I really eat many low carb protein sources actually I eat a lot of chickpeas pulses beans baby bell lights at the moment like that's my go-to at the moment and they're not low carb um at all no I I mean I I agree it completely in what you were saying like how you might want to think about adjusting your meals and moving towards um vegetarian protein sources might make you feel a bit different I mean some people experience a bit of bloating from it but but I think I can't say I've ever worried about the carbohydrate like proportion of a a vegetarian protein source I've just had it because I wanted it and then thought about what else I want to go in that meal and then (laughs) that's be that yeah and like if you're on a fat loss journey like we say this knowing that if you're on a fat loss journey it's going to be more difficult but it's it's the same premise still applies in that you just will have to have fewer carbohydrates or fewer fat and um fat sources to manage the calorie intake that you've got and if you're if you are on a fat loss journey and you're vegetarian then having things like greek yogurt having things like protein powder um and Linda McCartney sausages I think are I mean are like 100 and god I don't know off the top of my head maybe 160 calories for three maybe something like that something like that isn't something it? like that so like not um huge like like that's really not much compared to like a heck chicken sausage which I think chicken they used to be like I want to say 120 calories for three for three I can't believe I don't remember that when I ate them every single day on prep for like two years um but so yeah, you have to of course if you're on a fat loss journey, like yeah, you're gonna have to be mindful of it. But zero carbon protein, zero carbon fat sources of vegetarian protein don't really exist. Um apart from Greek yogurt, no, pretty much and with protein. Okay. Um are there any types of workouts or sports that you recommend in adding into a training program for a bit of variety? whatever you like to do and I know that's such a crappy answer but everyone likes different stuff I like skateboarding you like horse riding like I'm trying to think of what the other girls do don't know people love people love BJJ everyone who does BJJ is like this changed my life it makes me think I might want to do it but I got a nose shop and I'm like I don't really want to break my nose that, that's the only thing I'm not no I don't want to yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm not sure about that um but if, but if there's a class I, I hear such amazing things about it obviously yoga pilates I like to run these days. my clients did um bar classes as well this week oh what was the feedback feedback was good although one was like it has just uh how did she say she was like uh it has just reaffirmed that I have no grace. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's like, what I think yeah, was happened to me. I'm with you there and we just accept it. But she, what was really great was she was like, but that wasn't the reason that I went. I just went to her um, intention for the week was to add in more play. So that's Good for her. Did. Good for her because I, I, would I like to try it? I feel like it might oh no I, 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 it's not even the embarrassment of it for me it's more just like you know it's like I'm okay with not being good at things 
but when I'm not good at something and also it hurts <laughs> I think I'm a bit more like I don't know if I want to do it <laughs> um I booked a an, a 75 minute yoga class in London on Saturday Ashtanga Ooh. Oh, very nice. No, because I, I because on ETPHD monthly group on the Facebook group, I committed to doing a one in person yoga class, and I don't love the yoga around here, and so I promised that I would do it to myself. So I've, I've I promised myself I would do it, not do it to myself. So I am um, committed vocally and booked it in. We'll feed back on that. Yeah, I went to one last night, and we were doing some weird kind of sequence at the end, and I was. Like like you were saying, there were moments where I was like, "Oh, I can do this," and then moments where I was like, "I really can't do that." So, <laughs> don't you think? Especially sometimes when you film it, and you're like, "I'm doing this," and then you look back at your video that you took and you think, "That was not doing that." What I was, was I doing? I was quite pleased. I was at the back, and she couldn't like probably hear me grunt and roll about. I was like, God, this is not going to be good. <laughs> oh gosh, we can only try um George's question kind of ties into this will you be incorporating yoga into your programming or will that be an additional thing like the gym training um so I suppose, suppose this question was probably done before we launched the the monthly session so yes all ETPHC clients get twice monthly yoga from uh, Roslyn and um if you're not an ETPHD client you can join that on the ETPHD monthly page which the details are on the website for that and with that you get every other week meditation class from me and every other week yoga class with Roz. Okay, Anna, question. Um, at what point do you feel like you're ready for a fat loss period? Great question. I actually had a conversation about one, with one of the coaches that I mentor about this this morning. Um, not an ETPHC coach. Um, I think, what do I think? I think one questions to ask yourself one how do I feel about my relationship with food do I feel like I have an overall healthful relationship with food and what that looks like is rarely overeating but sometimes you might emotionally eat fine really overeating and uh, not preoccupied by food not preoccupied by my body um food doesn't have a negative impact on my life I have a good relationship with exercise I, I have a good relationship with rest I'm comfortable with taking rest and then thinking, what am I trying to achieve with this fat loss goal? Like, why do I want fat loss? Um, why is that important to me? And it might be, oh, I want to look better in a bikini. But why do you think that is better? Um, is it because you want to be leaner for someone else or is it because you want to be leaner for yourself? Is it for your health reasons? Um, is it because you think you'll be happier when you're in a leaner body? Now, there's no wrong answer to any of this stuff, but I think the happiness one is important because, again, another coach actually this morning that I mentor I was speaking to, and um, and it's only nine forty. Gosh, I'm so productive. Just you're oh, on it. Honestly, go me. Um, definitely not overworking as a way to regulate myself at all. Skip <laughs> uh, over that. No, never, never, never. Um, but one thing that we were talking about was like um. I said, you know, like, what is it going to feel like? And um, she was putting things off because she wasn't in the, she feels like she's putting things off because she's not in the body that she wants to be yet. And I said, like, what's it going to feel like in 12 months time if you look back and think, I haven't done, um, I didn't do those things that I wanted to do because I felt like I wasn't in a good enough body to do that. And you've wasted 12 months of that part of your life. I don't mean your entire life, but that, that goal part of your life for your body. So I think it's important to think about, um, like, what is it that you're really trying to achieve? And are you working towards those things now, even without fat loss? So if it's happiness, are you working on your happiness now without fat loss? Because I can guarantee you that your happiness is not going to change with your fat loss. Um, and, and being really honest with yourself with those things. Mm, that, yeah, reminds me of a conversation I've been having with a client who's working through the the narrative that before she can start dating she needs to lose body weight and I mean I'm not here to say either way um but naturally I asked her to to have a think like is is the body that you're in stopping you from doing these things right now or is that just the limiting belief that you have and equally I think I mean 
I, I would question as well, and this is something that I posed to this client, is like, how would you then feel if you were in a smaller body and got into a relationship and then put on some weight? How would that, because it's ultimately that's probably going to happen. You're never going to stay that one same weight. We know that weight maintenance isn't like that. And is that going to cause more problems in how you feel about your body and, and worries further down the line? And I think sometimes you just have to kind of lean into the discomfort on that on that side and prove yourself that actually, yeah, I mean, fat loss, like you said, running through those things and making sure that you are mentally in a good place, but also making sure that you're not holding back from doing things just because you think a smaller body is going to get you there. Yeah, I love that. Love that. Okay, George's question. How can I feel more confident in situations with men? Gosh, I'm not sure that we asked her the right <laughs> I'm the only female at my work and it's a struggle sometimes. If I try to take space, I become the bossy one. But if I'm sweet, no one listens. Mm. We're mulling. We're mulling. Oh, it's, it's a tricky one, right? Because... I part of me says like is that just how you're viewing yourself it as being the bossy one because if you're not used to kind of being assertive that is how it can feel but I know full well equally in like a male dominated dom- dominated yeah <laughs> yeah like environment they can be that as as soon as you start to speak up there can be that backlash from them about it as well so yeah it's it's a tricky one for sure yeah I think I think that's such a good point in the sense of like the self-awareness of is this a is this does is it true that I am bossy or is it this me not people pleasing I think that's such a great question um I think do you I think are you trying to be liked or are you trying to be confident because unfortunately yes we know that confident women in the workplace often are um, deemed as slightly less likable um and that's just this unconscious bias and that that we have or people who women who are more competent are often liked less and that's the competency likability bias and it sucks but are you trying to be competent confident and successful in that line of work or are you trying to be liked by people and if you're trying to be liked then fine people please be passive um don't use your voice and see how that sits with you and if that feels right for you then who are we to say don't do that but if you're trying to be confident and progress then unfortunately you're going to have to risk not being liked by some people in order to get to where you want. And do I think it's right? No. Do I think that people won't like you? No. I think that I'm sure that people on the whole will still like you and respect you. But of course, there may there is the risk that people won't. But what are you going to do? You're just going to live your life and hope and try and please everyone. Because I know there are there are loads of people that, that don't like me. Loads. And actually, interestingly... Em and I were having this discussion the other day because we were looking at someone to get for level up and I said oh I really like this person and um so I went onto their Instagram page and they'd unfollowed me so I thought and I don't know how I realized oh yeah I went onto the page and um it said I was following them and then I don't know why I think I was looking to see if they followed Emma anyway they'd unfollowed me and I thought oh, that's interesting I've obviously said something that they don't like or I was wrong about something and they rather than were like discuss it with me they just decided to unfollow me whatever it's fine that happens to me that that can happen to me quite regularly it's happened to me before it will happen to me again um because I confidently speak in the middle ground probably because I confidently speak sometimes beyond my scope of practice to some degree I would imagine and I think some people probably don't like that and I also probably competently speak about things that are not 100% um scientifically rigorous and other people that I'm in that group with don't like that so like I know that people don't like me but is that worth me sacrificing my integrity and my truth no and so I think sometimes you have to be a little bit comfortable get a bit comfortable with this and I also think with the feminism side of this stuff 
it's really easy to get lost in getting pissed off about um misogyny and sexism and especially around the workplace and I am the first to speak up when I hear these things and about the the discrimination etc like I will always speak up for this stuff but I also think there's a level of and this is one reason why I haven't read that book that Georgia talks about the data the data book about how basically the world is made for men because I do think you can get to the point where it becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy and you keep yourself small because you've read that that's a better thing to do or you tell yourself not to bother because it's just a world made for men anyway and you just get angry and none of that is helpful so I think just be mindful of like the stories that you tell yourself and getting lost in those and and really just without sounding like really cliche like what's my truth and what's aligned with my values and am I willing to sacrifice the you know the other stuff in order to live aligned with my values and my truth and hopefully you are yeah I was just gonna say like just to on a on a mm, said with compassion but ultimately you're there to get a job done um sometimes that means upsetting people Mm -hmm. exactly go out and upset people (laughs) (laughs) Um, um go for it I've realised that all of my hobbies are, well, hobbies are quote unquote, uh, fitness related. Any ideas on how I can begin to explore new ones? You know, my mum recently went on a walking holiday with strangers in Palma. Palma? Palma? Is that Mallorca? I'm not sure. Anyway, just somewhere in Spain, I think. Um, Just with the strangers because she wanted to go on a walking holiday and she was like yeah I'm just gonna do it and I just think gosh, oh, I <laughs> every day every day my mom does something and I think god you're just my goals in so many ways um and this was one of them I, I, the reason I say that is because you kind of just have to go what might I like to try google it and do it and it's it, it sounds really simple, but I definitely have found this when I've travelled and been away on my own and things. And I'm like, oh, I want to do I want to do a meditation class. So I'll just Google meditation classes and I'll go and find one and I'll just go to it. Um, or um, hiking groups or knitting groups or book clubs or anything at all. One of my clients who used to work with me, she started a book club because she wanted to go to a book club and she didn't have, and there weren't one. Oh, I love that. <laughs> like, why would you not do that, right? It's a great idea. And I feel like, like, why don't we do stuff like that more often? I, I was interested in Buddhism. So I Googled Buddhist center and there was a Buddhist center five minutes down the road. So I went to that before I did my meditation class uh, training. There's, I think it's a really a case of just honestly Google it and being prepared to, to go to something and think, what the hell? I think next week I'm going to go to a lecture on psychedelics because I'm interested in psychedelics and there's a lecture in Liverpool about it, which I'd never heard of, but I saw it on some, when I Googled psychedelics Liverpool, something came up. I mean, <laughs> a lot of things could have come up there. And what was I really looking for? Um, and it was like on Eventbrite or it was on something like that. I don't really know. So I'm going to go to that if I've got the time. And so it, I really think like how lucky are we that we can literally type in anything that we want to do onto Google and the, I guarantee there'll be somewhere that you can do it and just about willing to go into sh- crappy stuff too and the sense of like you might go to a book club and it might be like you and Bob from down the road and really uncomfortable and like cold tea and that's horrible but then you won't do it again like you kind of just have to be willing to put yourself out there a little bit so going back to the client whose intention was play in her update this week she mentioned how it's all been about like reconnecting with her inner child and doing the things that she used to love as a kid and maybe that's like if you're feeling a bit stuck on like how to get started maybe that's something that you think about not necessarily like going back to things that you did as a child maybe but kind of what did you used to do before like fitness and training became such a big part of your life what were the things that you really enjoyed doing um are there like creative things that you might want to explore or fun things that can add an element of play um 
and then yeah like you said google <laughs> google um based off that just to kind of get the ball rolling mm, i love that idea of just thinking back to what you used to love i think that's such a great point um okay we're gonna leave it there because we are just so busy people and we've just got, it's only 10 a.m and we've just got more things to do and um, thank you so much for the great questions thanks so much anna thank you Bye-bye. bye bye